is a real, true, dramatic change about to take place in Israel and in the Middle East. We saw over 700 missiles launched on Israel last week from the Gaza Strip. And now we see a United States war fleet headed to face off with Iran in the Persian Gulf. Nevertheless, the Trump administration says that it's about to unveil a peace plan for Israel. And so that begs the question, will the Trump deal of the century bring about peace, war, or Armageddon? And that's a big, powerful question. We need to answer it in the light of Bible prophecies tonight. And I hope you'll stay with me for this hour. We're going to have a great program. I'm going to be headed to New York City here in about a month to attend the annual Jerusalem Post Conference. I was there last year and heard about 50 speakers of uh, some of the most powerful Israeli leaders and uh, some of the economic and military and medical and different segments, sectors of the Israeli lifestyle there. We see a lot of leaders there that have a lot of influence around the world, and it's a powerful conference. And this year, they claim that they're going to have a great in-depth discussion about the effects and the terms of the Trump deal of the century. So I'm looking forward to hearing that, and I think there's going to be a lot to talk about here very soon. The news is about to break. They're waiting on the Ramadan holidays of, of the Islamists to pass, and they say that as soon as Ramadan is over, this deal of the century is going to begin to be unrolled. So I want to ask some questions here tonight about it. Now, first of all, we've talked about this at pretty much length over some of the previous programs, and that is the fact that from all the hints and clues that we've been receiving recently about Trump's deal of the century, it looks like the two-state solution is just about a dead issue. It looks like it's going to be a one-state solution and that the Palestinians are not going to be offered a state, but rather they're going to be offered autonomy without statehood. And that means that they will be given self-governance within the state of Israel, but the state of Israel will continue to provide military cover throughout the Palestinian territories. Now, we know that there's a lot of history arguments that could be had about this thing, about whether the Palestinians really have any business being there, because the history of that entire Holy Land uh, goes back to Bible days. It goes back 4,000 years from the days of Abraham and then Mo Moses and Joshua and the kings of Israel and so on. And so we know that there's a big argument whether the Palestinians have any business actually being there. And, and there's another issue, too, and that is the fact that as late as the end of the 19th century, in the late 1800s, we had presidents and other world leaders that had visited part of the world. A lot of the history books record the condition of the Holy Land and specifically Jerusalem back at the turn of the century. And they said that it, the whole land was practically abandoned. When the British moved in there in 1917 and took over that Holy Land from the Ottoman Turks, the Ottoman Turks had virtually abandoned the entire region. And so there was almost nothing there. Jerusalem was just a small town. And now, under the uh, successful efforts of the new state of Israel, founded in May of 1948, Israel is a massive country, one of the greatest countries on earth, got one of the greatest militaries, one of the most robust economies, some of the most uh, scientific advancements in the fields of medicine and technology of any other nation in the world. And there's no going backward. Israel is going to continue to grow. I think the population was just said to have surpassed 9 million people recently. And so Israel has made its mark in the world. And it's almost unthinkable that these Islamists want to drive Israel completely off the map. And we know that it's not ever going to happen but they're going to try, and that's according to the prophecies of the Bible. We're going to see some pretty ugly things happen here before Jesus Christ returns, and ultimately it's going to lead us to the great and final battle of Armageddon. So I'm going to ask this question again. Is the Trump deal of the century, what is it actually going to do? Is it going to bring about peace in the Middle East, or is it going to bring about a war? And I have to say that uh, the reaction of several different players in this is going to have a whole lot to do with how it actually turns out. First of all, I want to talk for a moment about the Israeli response to the deal of the century. Now, we know that ever since Donald Trump was elected, he and Benjamin Netanyahu have been very close, have been very closely allied in all their efforts together. 
And their relationship, their friendship actually goes back, I think, 20 or 25 years. They've known each other for a long time. They've been friends for a long time. And we know that Trump has got a lot of uh, Jews in his his children, grandchildren are Jews. And so he's got a, a, a very much of an empathy, sympathy, uh, support of the state of Israel. And of course, Trump, having come from a Judeo-Christian background as he has, that also reinforces his feelings toward Israel. And so we know that at the, at the core, Trump's desire is to support Israel and help Israel. Nevertheless, we know that some of the terms of this deal of the century may not be particularly uh, acceptable to the state of Israel. We've already seen a lot of discussion about that in the media, and that is the fact that uh, even Jason uh, Greenblatt and Jared Kushner have said as much, that both sides are going to have to compromise to some degree. Both are going to have to forfeit a, a few of their own desired benefits in the name of peace. But uh, and the Palestinians have not responded well to that. They've told us over and over and over again that the Trump deal of the century is going to be dead on arrival. They have uh, effectively boycotted this entire procedure, and they've actually moved to supplant the effort by going to people like Erdogan of Turkey and Putin of Russia to try to come up with an alternative plan, and even the European Union. They've gone to Europe to try to get Europe to provide an alternative, and we know that Emmanuel Macron of France has, has done some things in this area. So Israel has tried to keep an open mind, and Netanyahu's got an open mind. Of course, he just now got reelected for his fifth term in Israel, and he's right now, uh, even as I speak, putting together coalition. That's not even been finalized yet, so they're not really, they haven't got back together and got the government back in order since the election, so we don't know yet exactly how the timing of this is all going to play out. Nevertheless, I still believe that uh, Israel is going to be, for the most part, favorable to this entire effort, and I expect to see Greenblatt and Kushner and David Friedman, the, the United States Ambassador to Israel, they're going to play a big role in this thing, and there's a lot of people, some of the Arabs even support this. We've got some support from UAE, we've got some support from Saudi Arabia, and a few of the other Gulf states there that are, are in favor of this. Some of them have even gone on the record as to say they don't necessarily support a Palestinian state, and that's a big deal. So, the Israeli response, we can expect that to be fairly favorable. The Palestinian response, on the other hand, uh, the Palestinians view this entire effort as a complete and utter betrayal of the Palestinians. And then we have the European Union. Now, there's an article published by Pamela Geller today in which she observed that the European Union has become an arm of the Islamic Jihad because during this period of Ramadan, the European Union has decided to send a financial uh, bequest to the, the Palestinian Authority to help them pay their payroll during the period of Ramadan, and this money is actually going to be used to pay some of the martyrs' families. Some of the martyrs who killed Jews are going to be paid out of this money that's being donated by the European Union. And, and we know, if you, if you look at this close enough, you realize there's enough Islamic influence in the European politics to know that the Europeans are, are at the point now, they're almost doing whatever the Muslims tell them to do. And as Pamela Geller said, the European Union has become an arm of Islamic Jihad. And that's a horrible thing, but that plays into the Bible prophecies from Daniel 7 and 8, where we see that little horn of Islam coming in there and upsetting the 10 horns of Europe. And he's going to overthrow three of the nations of Europe. He's going to cast them down. They're going to be plucked up. And he's going to subdue them. So by the Bible prophecies, we're expected to see a Muslim come into Europe and overthrow three of the European nations. And we already see it moving in that direction. We see Islam mushrooming all over Europe, and we see a big contest in Britain especially. Uh, Britain, just this week, uh, there was an article out that said the Queen of England, in preparing for a state dinner for President Trump, has disinvited or failed to invite the Muslim mayor of London, particularly because he's on the record as being very hostile uh, against Trump. And so the queen has decided not to invite the mayor of London to this state dinner. And so this kind of gives us an insight about how difficult this, the whole political situation in 
the United Kingdom is being infiltrated and taken over by Muslims. We've got over 40 mayors in the United Kingdom that are Muslim mayors. The population of Islam in Britain has just grown like crazy, and we're seeing even the Labor Party, run by Jeremy Corbyn, has become anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, and uh, Corbyn is causing a whole lot of trouble really on the world scene because of his anti-Israel uh, stuff. He supports the BDS movement and so forth, and even some of his own Labor Party people are calling for his dismissal, but uh, I don't know how that's going to happen. I can say this much, that a lot of this Islamic escalation in Britain and a lot of the a lot of the left wing rise is having the same effect in Britain that it's having in the United States. It's causing a right wing uh, revival. It's a revival of populism. We know how that Donald Trump won his election here in the United States on a populist platform where he he's he preaches nationalism, he preaches patriotism, and a lot of people don't like this new socialist uh, left-wing talk. They don't want to see this world fall into Islam or into socialism. And so we're seeing a revival of conservatism in this country. And a lot of that's happening in Britain. And that's a big part of what the Brexit movement is all about, because many of the Brits realize that, that the left-wingers in Europe, and uh, a lot of these are Islamists, are threatening their existence in Britain. And so the Brexit party voted here a couple of years ago to withdraw Britain from the European Union, but we got so many liberals in the political establishment there in Britain that they've tried to stop that Brexit from taking place. And uh, just recently, Theresa May, who's the prime minister of Britain, has gone through a big uh, upheaval where she failed for the, uh, for the umpteenth time to pull off this Brexit movement. And now Nigel Farage, who was the father basically of the Brexit movement has formed what's called the Brexit party. There's a new political party in Britain called the Brexit party. And the most recent polls indicate that the Brexit party has a good chance of winning the next election. So conservatism is, uh, is having a resurgence in Britain right now. And we're only hopeful. And, and, and I say that because some of that is beginning to show up in Europe as well, but I don't expect that the Europeans are going to be able to route this left-wing movement in, in, in Europe as a whole, because according to the Bible prophecies, we're fixing to see Europe really take a fall. We're going to see Europe, uh, the three nations, the three horns of that European, 10 horned European kingdom is going to fall according to the prophecies. And it looks like Islam is going to take over Europe. And the Bible said those 10 horns of Europe are going to hate the whore, which is the Roman Catholic church and destroy the Roman Catholic church. So uh, if that tells you anything about where we're headed in that Middle East situation, it looks like Islam is not going to be stopped. Islam is going to just keep on growing and keep on taking over Europe. And it may be that Britain fends them off for a while. And it may be that there is a right-wing revival or resurgence in Britain. But overall, we know, according to the prophecies of the Bible, that the European Union is going to end up being a part of this uh, onslaught against Israel. At Armageddon, we see... We see uh, the British lion is one of the seven heads of Revelation 13. The Russian bear is one of the seven heads. And so it's, it's an irony that Britain and Russia are depicted in Bible prophecies as being enemies of Israel at Armageddon. But we can see that taking shape. And it's happening because Islam is taking over all that territory. So that's, uh, that's a, a brief overview of the European response, the European Union response to the deal of the century. It looks like the deal of the century is not going to be welcomed. It's not going to be well received by the European Union. And that's largely because there is such a powerful uh, influence of, of both the liberalist, the, the left-wing liberals and the Muslim presence in Europe. The next, uh, the next actor to consider is Iran. What is Iran's response? going to be to Trump's deal of the century. Right now, we know that Iran is bristling with hostilities toward Israel and the United States. We saw just last week over 700 Iranian missiles fired on Israel from the Gaza Strip. We know that Iran has become a major, major player in the Gaza Strip, where where Hamas was once dependent on the Muslim Brotherhood out of Egypt for a lot of its moral support and financial support. They've been more or less disenfranchised from the Muslim Brotherhood, and now 
uh, Hamas is leaning on Iran, and Iran is perfectly happy to get involved because Iran wants to destroy Israel. And the Gaza Strip gives Iran another staging point to come in there and attack Israel. And we know that Iran is encircling Israel right now. Iran has basically taken over uh, Lebanon for all practical purposes through the Hezbollah political party up there in the Hezbollah terrorist organization. We know that Iran has infiltrated Syria very thoroughly. Uh, we've got Iranian bases all over Syria. They were complicit and in collusion with Bashar al-Assad of Syria. Uh, Iran has won a lot of the big major rebuilding contracts to rebuild Syria after the civil war they've had that destroyed so much of their infrastructure. Iran's going to be a major player. So Iran is well established, has a strong foothold in Syria, which is right on the northern Israeli border. And Iran has got a strong political and military presence in Iraq. So all the way around Israel, Iran is choking, it's tightening the noose on Israel. Now, partly in response to last week's missile attacks and then, of course, some of the other uh, situations, we know that Donald Trump uh, last year uh, pulled the United States out of the JCPOP, which was the uh, Iranian nuclear agreement that was supposed to prevent Iran from developing a, a nuclear bomb. Donald Trump knew that it was phony and knew that it was no good and it was a worthless agreement. So he pulled the United States out of it. He's been trying to get the European Union to pull out of it, but the European Union has refused to pull out of the JCPOP and the European Union has in effect tried to do an end run around Donald Trump's sanctions on Iran. While, while the United States has heavily, heavily, heavily sanctioned Iran, the European Union is trying to do an end run around that and provide ways for Iran to make money despite the American sanctions. And so this has put the U European Union at odds with the United States. And for that reason, our Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, According to today's news in Breitbart, Pompeo made a surprise visit to Brussels to discuss Iran with the European Union leaders. The Secretary of State Mike Pompeo postponed his trip to Moscow and went to Brussels instead today and determined to discuss the recent threatening actions and the statements by the, by the Islamic Republic of Iran with the foreign ministers of the European Union. According to the State Department, Pompeo wanted to coordinate closely with our allies and partners and ensure the security of our mutual interests in the Middle East and around the world. Now, one of the other actions that the United States has taken besides sending Mike Pompeo to talk to the European Union is that Trump has now sent the uh, super carrier, the Abraham Lincoln, into the Persian Gulf. It's an entire war fleet, uh, including the carrier and a lot of warships, and they're going into the Persian Gulf because Iran is threatening to cut off the Strait of Hormuz, which is going to have a global impact on the oil business, and we've got to protect ourselves from that. Plus, today, as of today, there is what some people say an inexplicable attack on several of the oil tankers there at one of the ports in the United States. Arab Emirates, that UAE's got a port there that had a bunch of Saudi tankers there, and uh, and they got hit. They got sabotaged, and some people are in denial. Iran denies that they had anything to do with it, but I don't think I don't think the United States is buying that. They're trying to pass it off as a false flag in some quarters, but uh, any thinking person can pretty well figure that that was an Iranian attack, and it's meant to to try to antagonize the United States. Whatever it turns out to be, we know that that whole region right now is harder than a firecracker, and there's going to be a lot more trouble. Now, to exacerbate all these things, Islam is right now in the month-long Ramadan period where there is great uh, emphasis on prayer and fasting of the, of the Muslims. Every day they fast, and at night they eat, but then they pray more than usual during these days. But along with this Ramadan period of fasting, we have a long history. We have a long history that shows that during the month of Ramadan, terrorism often is escalated. We see more terrorism. And that's, that's especially true in Israel and especially on the Temple Mount. I have an article here from uh, Breaking Israel News. 
to today that says, are the Palestinians planning another round of Temple Mount violence? Ramadan began eight days ago, and the security situation is already heating up on the Temple Mount, threatening to be as violent as it has been in the past. Muslim prayers at the site, at the holy site, the Temple Mount, on Fridays during the month of Ramadan are usually well attended, and this year is no exception. An estimated 135,000 to 180,000 Muslims have ascended the Temple Mount for the first Friday of this Ramadan this year, which is 50% more than attended the same event last year. Do you see how the Muslims are escalating against Israel? That's, that's what, 50,000 people more this year than were last year at the Ramadan prayers uh, there at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the Dome of the Rock. The Israeli police said that police units in Jerusalem secured the first Friday events for Ramadan in the old city and that the Israeli police forces secured over 135,000 people that took part in the prayers on the Temple Mount. The Israeli government eased travel restrictions, allowed some 75,000 people from Judea and Samaria. Of course, they call that the West Bank. Allowed them to pass through security checkpoints to Jerusalem. Men over the age of 40 and, uh, and children under 12 will be allowed to enter the city on Fridays during the month of Ramadan, and there are no restrictions on the women, according to the Israeli army. Now, there's a lot to talk about there, but it's almost, uh, you can read between the lines. These are hostile times, and we don't know how bad it's going to get. There's still quite a bit of time left on this Ramadan period, and we could see a lot more trouble before it's, it's over. In fact, uh, you kind of linked these missile attacks last week to the beginning of Ramadan and, uh, this conflict right there in the middle in the Persian Gulf is probably at least partly exacerbated by Ramadan. So we've talked about Israel's response to Trump's peace plan. We've talked about the Palestinians response to the peace plan. We've talked about, uh, the Europeans, response to the peace plan. We've talked about Iran's response to the peace plan. And now I want to talk about Turkey and Russia. Now I'm interested in all these because all of these players are mentioned in the Bible. We know that at the great and final battle of Armageddon, the Bible tells us that Gog and Magog are to come to fight against Jerusalem and Israel. And Gog and Magog in biblical terms is talking about modern Russia. Ezekiel 38 also tells us about Gomer and Tagarma, which speaks of modern Turkey. The prophecy also includes Persia, which is the ancient name of modern Iran. So we know that, that Russia, Turkey, and Iran are all scheduled by the prophecies of the Bible to come against Israel at the great and final battle of Armageddon, where Jesus Christ is going to come and crush them. It's going to be the greatest war Israel's ever seen. And then for all we know, it's going to very nearly annihilate Israel. We've got 144,000 Jews that are going to be sealed by God and protected for 42 months leading up to Armageddon. But Zechariah 13 tells us that two thirds of Israel is going to die during that. The ninth chapter of Daniel tells us that there's going to be, they're going to be consumed and left desolate during that period of time. Jesus said in Luke 21, 20, that when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, you know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And then the seventh chapter of Daniel tells us that Jerusalem is going to be divided by the man of sin. And so we can see that Jerusalem is going to be divided. Jerusalem is going to be encompassed by armies. Uh, Two-thirds of the Jews are going to die. The other third that remain there are going to go through a great trial. He said they're going to be tried by the fire like gold and silver is tried in the fire. And then at the end of all this 42 months of what Jesus called great tribulation, Jeremiah 33, 7 calls it a time of Jacob's trouble. Daniel 12 and 1 called it a time of trouble. These 42 months are going to literally be hell on earth for the Jews. The Assyrian man of sin is going to walk into the temple mount. He's going to close down the newly built temple. He's going to, it's going to commit an abomination there that's going to cause the Jews to have to evacuate it. Not only will they have to evacuate their new temple, but he's going to divide Jerusalem, which indicates that he's going to cause Jerusalem to be divided, and uh, at least half of Jerusalem is going to come under Muslims' total control during that period of time. And at the end of that, Jesus Christ is going to come back. And so it's, we need to know what Russia's got on its mind right now, and we need to know what Turkey has on its mind right now. So I'm going to talk about that for a minute. 
The question is, how will Turkey and Russia respond to Trump's deal of the century? Now, here's what you got to keep in mind. First of all, the president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is very much an anti-Semite. He is very much a defender of the Palestinians and the Gazans. It goes back it goes back many years, ever since he's been in power. He started out back in the 1990s as the, as the mayor of Istanbul, and he was a very popular politician. Then he was elected to be the uh, president of Turkey. Uh, he had two full terms as the president. Then they rewrote the Constitution, and last year they, they elected him again for a longer term with a more powerful term, which made him, in effect, a dictator over the nation of Turkey. And in his day, Erdogan has turned Turkey from what was in modern times a secular state into a radical Islamic state. In fact, millions if not billions of dollars are being spent on the Islamization of Turkey. As if it wasn't Islamic enough, the government now is doing things like sponsoring uh, Turkish apps to to use on the phone that, that teaches the citizens all of the teachings of the Quran. They're, they're, they're investing millions, if not billions of dollars in the school systems to teach all the children all the teachings of the Quran in their schools. And so there is a revival of is Islamism, radical Islamism in Turkey. And even though in the last election, just last month, uh, Erdogan suffered kind of a defeat because his ruling party lost uh, the mayor of Istanbul, and they lost the mayor of Ankara. Now, in this past week, Erdogan has overturned the election. He's overturned the election. Now, when you look close enough at this guy, you, can, you cannot help but ask yourself, is this guy possibly going to be that Assyrian man of sin that the Bible talks about? Is this the little horn? And, and a lot of us have been looking at him for a long time, and the, there's a strong suspicion that this guy Erdogan could be the man of sin. He could be the guy that comes into the temple and commits the abomination of desolation. We know he hates Israel. He wants the Muslims to control all that. He has two major objectives in Israel. He wants to rebuild the old Ottoman Empire, and, the, and that holy land was part of the old empire, the old Ottoman Empire. And he wants to be the caliph of a global Islamic caliphate. And that means he wants to rule Israel under a caliphate. And he spent lots of money, millions and millions of dollars. He's donated to the Palestinian Authority. He spent a lot of money on the Gaza, uh, on, on Hamas and other powers down in the Gaza Strip. He sent flotillas down there to send them supplies and help them out. And he is politically defending them on the world stage. And so we've seen recently how that Turkey and Iran have been meeting with Vladimir Putin of Russia, and they're forming the Armageddon coalition. I mean, the coalition is already built. It's already there. And the seventh verse of Ezekiel 38 tells us that Russia, Gog, is going to be a guard to Turkey and Iran in that last scenario. Now, you see that exactly is what happened right now because Russia is down there in Syria right now with air bases. It's got warships out in the Mediterranean Sea. It's got troops on the ground in Syria. And Russia is working in collusion with Erdogan of Turkey. In fact, one of the big news items is the fact that Turkey uh, has bought the S-400 anti-aircraft missiles from Russia recently and, and basically uh, – spurned the United States offer to sell them Patriot missiles. And that's put Turkey at odds with the United States, and it has aligned Turkey with Russia even more. It's reinforced its relationship with Russia. So Turkey and Russia are getting tighter and tighter, and Turkey and the United States are getting further and further apart. And that's breaking up, that's messing up NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and it spells bad news for a future scenario. Now, we've got two biblical scenarios. The Sixth Trumpet War is going to be a war with the White Horse of Catholicism, the Red Horse of Communism, the Green Horse of Islam, and the Black Horse of Capitalism on the Euphrates River in Syria. And we see those powers there already. 
We've got a Kurdish conflict going on there because Erdogan of Turkey doesn't like the Kurds, and he's, he's been on driving the Kurds out of Syria. He's already established a, a, a Turkish buffer zone in Syria. He's practicing he hegemony in there. He's trying to take over some of the Syrian territory. He's trying to play his cards really hard in that area, and he's trying to win friends and influence people with all the Muslims in the world. He's going all over the world trying to build up a consensus among the worldwide Muslims to be their next caliph, to be their world ruler. And so even if politics in Turkey don't go so well for Erdogan, he looks like what the Bible called a king of fierce countenance. He's a mean old dude. He's, he's, a, he's trouble. He spells trouble for everybody and everything. And I think this could very well be, and if it's not him, then it's probably going to be somebody just like him right after if, he, if he's ever taken from the scene for whatever reason. So I'm telling you that when the Trump peace plan is opened, when, when the deal of the century is, in, is introduced, you can expect the Palestinians are going to hate it. And the more they hate it, the more they're going to turn to people like Turkey and the Russians and the European Union to help them drive back Trump. The Palestinians are going to align themselves with the Turks and the Russians and the Europeans to try to stop Trump's deal of the century. And that's going to put the United States at odds with the European Union, Russia, and Turkey, and Iran. That's a six trumpet war scenario. It's exactly what a six trumpet war scenario is all about. And ultimately it leads us to the great and final battle of Armageddon because once that once that six trumpet war is done, then all those armies are going to move from there down to Jerusalem. And that's where they're going to finally try to destroy Israel completely. And that's all prophecies. That's all in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. The Bible tells us uh, the 14th chapter of Zechariah verse one, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem. Now this is an Armageddon prophecy. God said, I'm going to gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet, whose feet? The feet of the Lord Jesus Christ shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before, this is an Old Testament prophecy about Jesus Christ, guys which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall be removed toward the north and half toward the south. And in the ninth verse he says, The Lord shall be king over all the earth, and in that day there shall be one Lord in his name, one. That's talking about Jesus Christ. This is the battle of Armageddon. And we're seeing all of the players. I mean, it's like chess pieces moving on the chessboard. They're all moving into place for the last move. We're about to see the end of this game played out, y'all. It's like a puzzle. We've just got a few pieces left in this puzzle, and the whole picture is going to be finished, and Jesus is going to be back, and the thousand-year kingdom of Jesus Christ is going to be underway. Now, that brings me to the next player I've talked about. We're talking tonight about Trump's deal of the century and how it's going to affect Israel, the Palestinians, the European Union, the Iranians, the Turkish, and Russia. Now, there's one more I want to talk about, and that is the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, or shall I say the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. How is Trump's deal of the century going to affect the Roman Catholic Church? Now, we don't know, and I can't say exactly how the Vatican is going to respond to Trump's deal of the century, because we don't know what it is yet. And I don't know if they know. Maybe the Vatican knows some things that they're not allowed to tell. I don't know. But I'm going to just uh, kind of prefab a scenario here and ask some questions based on it. And I've asked this question before, but I think it's a, a valid question. What if the Re Roman Catholic Church looks at Trump's deal of the century and likes it? What if the Pope says, you know, that sounds good because the deal is Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt have insisted adamantly that they want to do good for both sides. The big argument of their, of their whole project has been, 
We have not had any preconceived ideas about how this should come into existence. What we've tried to do is research what both parties want. We have tried to, to calculate what is best for Israel and what is best for the Palestinians. Their argument is that the Trump deal of the century is going to offer both sides many, many rewards. They're trying to make this thing as enticing as possible for both Israel and the Palestinians, so much so that the Palestinians and the Israelis will be willing to make whatever concessions are necessary to make it happen. Now, we don't know what it's going to be. This thing could fall. It could just, it could go up in smoke in a flash. Who knows? But on the other hand, we've got a lot, a lot of power and a lot, a lot of people and a lot, a lot of money that's invested in this project. A lot of the Muslims, a lot of the Arab countries down there have been talking and been negotiating with this thing. And so we can only expect that at least some of the Muslim world is going to be for this deal. And if perchance, you got to, you got to get this. If by chance the Trump deal of the century is appealing to the Roman Catholic church, then we might see, one of the most important prophecies in the Bible come to pass very soon. If the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church likes the terms of Trump's deal of the century, they might decide to endorse it. Are you with me? If the Pope happens to like the terms of Trump's deal of the century, then we might have what is called in the book of Daniel chapter nine, the confirmation of the covenant because the book of Daniel says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. He who the prince of the people that destroyed Jerusalem. If you know your history, you know, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. It was a fulfillment of ancient old Test, old Testament prophecies. It was a, it was a fulfillment of Jesus prophecy. Jesus prophesied that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and the temple was going to be torn down. Not one stone will be left. And it was the Romans that did it. And that fulfilled Daniel's prophecy in 927 of Daniel, the 24th through the 27th verses there. So we know the people that destroyed Jerusalem were the Romans and the prince of the people is the Prince of Rome. Now, when I say Prince of Rome, I'm not talking about a Prince like Prince Harry or Prince Charles or any of these. I'm talking about a demon Prince. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. Paul said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but we're wrestling with principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness, of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places or heavenly places. And so I'm telling you today that the Prince of Rome, which is the Roman demon in the heavens, the ground prince that represents the demon prince of Rome is the Pope of the Roman Catholic church. And if the, and the Bible said he is going to confirm the covenant with many for one week and that one week in prophecy terms is seven years. So what that verse says in, in modern vernacular is when the Pope of the Roman Catholic church confirms a covenant with many for seven years, then we know that we have entered into the last seven years which prophecy students call Daniel's 70th week. And that seven years begins with the confirmation of the covenant, and it ends with the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Is it possible that you and I are right now about to see the confirmation of the covenant? Now, this takes me back to the title of this program tonight. Will Trump's deal of the century bring peace? Will it bring war? Or will it bring Armageddon? And I'm telling you that in the long term, it's going to bring Armageddon. In fact, I got to say, if Trump didn't even exist, if Jason Greenblatt and, and Jared Kushner, if none of these guys had done a thing, we're headed to Armageddon, whether you like it or not. In, in the bottom line of it is, it doesn't make a difference what is in the Trump peace plan. It doesn't make a difference. We can f fuss and fight and talk about all the terms of the peace plan all you want to. But the terms of the peace plan have absolutely no effect on Bible prophecies because the Bible says we're going to see the Pope confirm whatever deal, and seven years later Jesus is going to come back at arm again because Israel is going to be almost completely annihilated. So where does that put us right now? That puts us potentially bumper to bumper with the beginning of the last seven years 
before Jesus returns. Now, you know, it's talking about all these things that makes me believe all over again that I'm right for believing the Bible because the prophecies of the Bible are so shockingly accurate. It just, it's mind boggling how accurate the prophecies of the Bible. Keep in mind, friend, those prophecies, some of the earliest of them were from Jesus' time. That's 2,000 years ago. The prophecies of Daniel are 2,500 years ago. The prophecies of Zechariah and these other guys, they, that, some of these prophecies, you go back, I mean, the, the earliest, you, you know, the oldest Armageddon prophecy happened in the Garden of Eden. God Almighty told the serpent, he said, I'm going to raise up a seed of the woman. That goes back 6,000 years. Enoch, before, before Noah's flood, Enoch prophecy, the, prophesied, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. Enoch prophesied Armageddon before Noah's flood. All of these prophecies have been on the books for 6,000 years. I should say on the record, the book, the book itself is about 3,400 years old. And here we are looking at everything the prophecies tell us. And Jesus said there's going to be one generation at the end of this period where all of these prophecies will be fulfilled. And that generation started 71 years ago tomorrow, 1948. Israel, the state of Israel was born for modern times. That was, as it were, Ezekiel 37 being fulfilled. God raised up the valley of the dry bones and he created a new nation. He told them back there, he said, if you go, if you go to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, you'll see this big banner, this big marble monument over the entrance. And it has that scripture from the book of Isaiah. He said, I'm going to raise you from your graves, O Israel. God raised them as it were from their graves and he put them back in their land. That was what the prophecy said. Isaiah said it, Ezekiel prophesied it. Some of the other prophets made prophecies along those lines. God's been saying from the very beginning that although Israel was going to be spread among the nations with many years without a king, without a, without a, sacrifice he was going to bring them back together in the end of time and that's what we've seen we've seen israel come back and that generation that started 71 years ago is the last generation and we've got seven more years that have to be fulfilled before jesus comes so that means that's if you add the 71 we've already passed and seven out of that that's 78 years and the book of psalm chapter 90 verse 10 says the days of our years are three score and 10, which is 70 years. And if by reason of strength, they be four score, which is 80 years, yet is their strength, labor and sorrow. Listen carefully to what I'm going to say here. We are in the last 10 years of an 80 year generation. And that the book of Psalms says those last two, 10 years are labor and sorrow. Did you get that? I suppose it was David that wrote that in the 90th chapter. But whoever wrote it said, if, if, if by reason of strength we live beyond the age of 70 to be 80 years old, you can expect those last 10 years to be labor and sorrow. Now, if you put that in prophetic terms about what's going on in Israel today, we've just started those last 10 years of prophecy being fulfilled in the state of Israel. And the old and the book in Psalm says, the verse in Psalm says, those 10 years are going to be labor and sorrow. Do you think those you think those two words, labor and sorrow, have any connection whatever to the last seven years and especially the last 42 months in which Jesus called them great tribulation? He said, Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no nor shall ever be. He said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. Daniel called it consummation. He called it desolation. He said in the 24th verse of Daniel 9, he said, 70 weeks are determined on, on thy people to finish the transgression, to make an end of iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, and to anoint the most holy. What's he doing? He's going to make, a, make an end of the sins of Israel. He's, bring, he's, going to, he's going to finish their transgression and make an end of their sins. Israel is in sin to this day because they re rejected Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, and God's going to make an end of their sins. He's going to finish their transgressions. He's going to consume them and leave them desolate. And, he, and by all of that purging, by all that punishment during this period of time, he's going to bring in everlasting 
righteousness when Jesus Christ comes back to save them, and then they're going to anoint the most holy. And the scripture said, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn. We're expecting to see these Jews, both those who are alive and remain when he comes back, and those who are resurrected from the dead at his coming. Because God said in Ezekiel 37, he said, I'm going to raise you up from your graves. If you go to Israel, you see all the tombs, the tens of thousands of tombs right there below the eastern gate. And the reason those Jews were buried below the eastern gate, because they know the prophecy said they're going to come out of their graves when Jesus comes. God's going to raise those Jews up as mortals. While the church has just been raised up at that time, the dead, the, the dead Christians are going to be raised up from their graves, and the living Christians are going to be changed in a moment of twinkling of an eye, and they'll be caught up to meet Jesus in the clouds and go straight to Armageddon. And meanwhile, these Jews are going to come out of their graves wherever they are, and they're going to see Christ, and they're going to weep and mourn for him. And the Bible said he's going to fill them with his spirit and write his laws in their heart. And so Paul said, and so shall all Israel be saved. Israel's going to have a revival when Jesus comes back because they're going to finally realize he really is their God. He really is their Savior. And we're all headed for that with lightning speed. We're headed like a bullet train for Armageddon. Right now, we are headed for the Battle of Armageddon, and it's going to be, unless you're old as dirt or unless you're in some kind of an accident between now and then, you're going to live to see Jesus come on the clouds in this world right here. Unless you die in the Great Tribulation, if you take the mark of the beast, they may try to kill you. If you don't take the mark of the beast, they try to kill you. If you do take the mark, God's going to destroy you in the lake of fire. Folks, these, this stuff is getting dead serious. Now, I'm, I'm just telling you. If you want to write me off as a kook, that's your business. But I'm telling you, these prophecies in this Bible are absolutely one million percent true, if it's possible or anything to be a million percent. These book, th this book is true. It is inerrant, inerrant. It is infallible. This is God's holy word. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Another verse said, not one jot or tittle is ever going to pass. That means the dotting of an I and a crossing of a T. Every, every punctuation in this book, in the original language, is absolutely divine by God. It's divinely inspired. You can believe every word of this book, and it says Jesus is coming back, and I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. Now, what are you going to do about this? I'm not just preaching this for your entertainment. I'm not in the entertainment business. I'm in the preaching business. I'm in the gospel preaching business. I'm, not, I'm really not in the prophecy business. I'm in the preaching. I'm a gospel preacher, and I'm trying to get your soul saved. I'm trying to do what I can to convince you that the Bible is true, and you need to prepare to meet God because Jesus is coming back. And I'm going to tell you something about the coming of the Lord. When the Lord comes, you, you'll face your last opportunity. If you're not ready to meet him before he gets here, you're not going to be saved. You're going to spend eternity in hell if you don't get right with God. Now is the appointed time. Right now is the day of salvation for you. If you want to be saved, now, this very day, is the time to act. You need to get your heart right with God. That means, means you should put away your sins. That means you need to stop transgressing against God. You need to repent of your sins. Sin, by definition, is the transgression of the law. And that, I'm speaking of the law of God. And anybody tells you you don't have to answer the law of God is an idiot. The, the law of God is as real and true as it ever was. If there was no law, there would be no sin. And there is God's laws are still in force because sin still exists. But thank God there's grace for the sinner if you will repent. And i got to tell you something. Don't listen to these grace preachers that lead you to believe that the grace of God covered all your sins. But Jesus said twice, except you except you all repent, you shall all likewise perish. Except you repent, you will all likewise perish. He said that twice. And I'm telling you, if you don't put away your sins, if you don't quit transgressing God's law, if you don't change your lifestyle, if you don't start doing what the Bible tells you to do and living the way God wants you to live, talking the way he wants you to talk, walking the way he wants you to walk, acting and dressing and doing all the things that God wants you to do, if you don't quit transgressing against God, you're going to go to hell. I say that as honestly and openly as I know how to tell you. Don't let that happen. Get your heart right with God. Get your life in order. Get your house in order. Do the will of God. Peter said to them, repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. If you want your sins to be put away, you have to obey Jesus Christ. He said that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name throughout all the world. He told them that in Luke 24, 47. He told Nicodemus, Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, he said, except you're born of the water and of the spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. If you want to be in the kingdom of God for all the ages of eternity, you have to be born of the water and of the spirit. And that's talking about water baptism and spirit baptism. You got to get in the water and have your sins remitted because you obeyed him and were baptized in his name because there is salvation in no other, for there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. If you don't get the name of Jesus over you, you're not going to be saved. And the way you get the name of Jesus over you is go to the waters and be baptized in Jesus' name. That's why Ananias told Saul, he said, Arise, brother Saul, and, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Ananias was telling Saul to go get baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And I'm telling you that if you want your sins to be remitted, that is put away. Now we know that Jesus shed his blood and the Bible said without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So Jesus paid for your sins with his blood. But if you don't go to the water and get baptized in Jesus name, you don't get the blood applied. It's by your obedient act of being baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ, that the blood of Jesus washes away your sins and your sins are marked off the record in heaven. Water baptism in Jesus name is for the remission of your sins. Go do it today. Go find the church that'll baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. And then he said, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The promise unto you and your children, as many as are far off, as many as long. The vast majority of so professing Christians will not tell you that you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But this Bible tells us that we do. Paul said, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And I'm telling you, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you don't have eternal life because the Holy Ghost baptism is where you receive the spirit of life. Jesus said, if you drink this water, you'll never thirst again. He said, he that believes on me out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of water of life. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe upon him should receive. You get eternal life when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. That's where the river, that's where the fountain of the waters of life begins to flow in you. And if you never receive the Holy Ghost, you never get the fountain of life and you won't be saved. Born of the water born of the spirit. I say this with great urgency. I say it with great desire, with great urgency to you tonight. Please hear what I'm telling you. You know, in America, we've finally come to realize that the vast majority of our mainstream media is fake news. But I got to tell you that the same thing is true in Christianity today. The biggest part of modern Christianity is fake Christianity. And just like people are beginning to wake up and realize that a lot of their news sources are fake and they're lying to them. I'm trying to convince you that a lot of your Christian sources are lying to you as well. Fake Christianity is a bigger problem than fake news. Fake churches is a bigger problem than fake news. Fake preachers is a bigger problem than fake news. Fake gospels is a bigger problem than fake news. I'm trying to tell you, I've told you what the Bible says. Be born again of the water and the spirit. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the new birth. And without the new birth, Jesus said, if you're not born again, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. So I'm telling you, obey the gospel. It's not that hard. It's not hard. All you got to do is find a church. Find an apostolic church. When I say apostolic, I'm talking about a church that practices the apostles' way. They, they, they preach the oneness of God. They preach Acts 2.38. They preach Jesus' name baptism. They preach repentance. They preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They practice being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. It's a Pentecostal, apostolic, holiness church that you need to find. Go find a church like that and get born again this week and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Because whether you like it or not, you can deny everything I've said tonight, but whether you like it or not, Jesus is coming soon. And that's my message to you tonight. And I thank you for being with me. Go to my website, kenradio.com. Sign up for the free Bible studies. I send you a free Bible study once every day. If you will go to amazon.com, look up my 
books, search on Amazon for books by Ken Raggio. Look at all nine books there. They're all Pentecostal books. You'll enjoy these and they'll be a blessing to you. And uh, also follow me on all my social media, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Watch all my YouTube videos there. And if you want to go to Israel with me, I'm going to Israel every November. Uh, look on my website and you'll see a link there to that. If you're interested in going to Israel with me this November, let me know and I'll be glad to take you with it. God bless you. Thanks again. See you ever Monday night and Thursday night, 9 p.m. Central. Good night.